Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's January 28th. Today, we celebrate an 18th century man who was a friend of many famous gardeners and the Danish surgeon associated with many wonderful plants from the Himalayas. We'll learn about the Swedish botanist who had a thing for algae and the man who started the only arboretum during his time between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. Today's unearthed words feature poems and prose about winter's cold, and we grow that garden library with a wonderful book about weird plants. I'll talk about a beautiful item that is perfect for a Valentine's gift for a gardener or a special gift for a loved one. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of a man who made the poinsettia a harbinger of Christmas. But first, let's catch up on a few recent events. Here's today's curated articles. The Conversation shared an article written by Tanya Laddie about Maria Sibylla Mirian. This article is part of their series that looks at underappreciated women through the ages. Maria Sibylla Mirian is the woman who linked caterpillars to butterflies, and her botanical illustrations were simply superb. Maria is one of my all-time favorite people that I've covered on the show. If you'd like to read Tanya's article in detail, just search for Maria in the Facebook group for the show. Next up was an article from Gardener's World featuring the Savoy Cabbage January King. Savoy Cabbage is a cool season vegetable. It has pretty crinkled leaves and is among the most tolerant of frosts, making it a great choice for fall gardens and, depending on your growing zone, winter gardens as well. January King is a beautiful variety. If you're interested in growing it, just search for King in the Facebook group for the show, and this article will pop right up and you can read all about it. Now, if you'd like to check out these curated articles for yourself, you're in luck because all of it gets shared in the listener community for the show in a free Facebook group called the Daily Gardener Community. So you don't have to take notes or track down links. It's all done for you by sharing it in the Facebook group. If you want to join the next time you're on Facebook, just pop on up to the search bar, type in the Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'll get a notification on my phone, and then I'll admit you into the group. Then once you're in, all of the wonderful articles that I curate for you will be sprinkled in amongst updates from your friends and family. Then when one of my curated articles strikes your fancy, you can click on it to read more. And if you have questions about your garden or suggestions for the show, you can certainly leave those comments in the group as well. And don't forget to share pictures of your garden. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of a fellow of the Royal Society, an avid gardener, and a friend of many scientific leaders in the mid-18th century in the city of London, Peter Collinson, who was born on this day in 1694. Peter introduced nearly 200 species of plants to British horticulture, importing many of them from his friend John Bartram in America. And when the American gardener John Custis learned that Collinson was looking for the mountain cowslip, Primula auricula, he happily sent him a specimen. Auricula means ear-shaped, and the mountain cowslip is commonly known as a bear's ear from the shape of its leaves. The cowslip is a spring-flowering plant, and it's native to the mountainous areas of Europe. 
Custis also sent Collinson a Virginia bluebell or Virginia cowslip known as the Mertensia virginica. This plant is another spring beauty that can be found in woodlands. The blue in the Virginia bluebell is so striking that it's an old-fashioned favorite for many gardeners. The Virginia bluebell is also known as lungwort or oysterwort. The plant was believed to have medicinal properties for treating lung disorders, and the leaves tasted like oysters. Virginia bluebells bloom alongside the daffodils, so you end up with a beautiful yellow and blue combination together in the garden. It's something highly coveted and absolutely gorgeous. Collinson was not the only gardener in search of Virginia bluebells. Thomas Jefferson wanted them, and he grew them at Monticello, and he loved them so much that they were often referred to as Jefferson's Blue Funnel Flowers. Collinson once wrote, Forget not me and my garden. Given Peter's influence on English gardens, he would be pleased to know that after all these years, he has not been forgotten. In 2010, the author Andrea Wolf popularized Collinson in the book The Brother Gardeners, a generation of gentlemen naturalists and the birth of an obsession, one of my favorite books by one of my favorite authors. And today is the birthday of the Danish surgeon and botanist Nathaniel Wallach, who was born on this day in 1786. Nathaniel served as the superintendent of the East India Company's Botanical Garden in Calcutta, India. Wallach's early work involved writing a flora of Asia. The palm Wallachia disticca was named in Wallach's honor. The name of the species disticca comes from the Greek distikos, dis meaning two, and stikos means line. Distikos refers to the leaves of this palm, which emerge in two rows on opposite sides of the stem. The Wallachia disticca is a very special palm. It's native to the base of the Himalayas, and the trunk is quite beautiful because it's covered in a trellis of fiber mat. It's simply gorgeous. This palm tree can grow to be 30 feet tall, but it's a short-lived palm with a lifespan of just 15 years. Now, Wallach was the first to describe the giant Himalayan lily, the Cardiocrinum giganteum, the largest species of lily. It's hardy in USDA zones 7 through 9. The giant Himalayan lily can grow up to 12 feet tall. Once it's finished blooming, the mother lily bulb dies, but luckily numerous offsets develop from the parent bulb. This dying off is common among plants that push a bloom many feet into the air. It takes enormous energy to create a towering and flowering stalk. If you decide you'd like to grow giant Himalayan lilies, and who wouldn't, expect blooms any time after year four. Today, the Nathaniel Wallach Memorial Lecture takes place every year at the Indian Museum in Calcutta on Foundation Day. Wallach founded the museum in 1814. And Wallach is buried in Kensal Green Cemetery in London, alongside many prominent botanists, like James Edward Smith, a founder of the Linnaean Society, and John Claudius Loudon, the Scottish writer, 
Sir James McGregor, the Scottish botanist, Archibald Menzies, the surgeon botanist, and Robert Brown, the discoverer of Brownian motion, and also David Don, the Linnaean Society librarian and the first professor of Botany King's College, London. Today is also the anniversary of the death of a Swedish botanist who specialized in algae, Carl Adolf Augard, who died on this day in 1859. In 1817, Carl published his masterpiece, a book on the algae of Scandinavia. Carl's work studying algae was a major endeavor for him from the time he was a young man until his mid-50s. At that time, he became the Bishop of Karlstad. The position was all-consuming, and Carl put his botanical work behind him. Today is the birthday of the physician, naturalist, and civic leader of the South Central Kansas town of Belle Plaine, Dr. Walter E. Bartlett, who was born on this day in 1870. In 1910, Bartlett started the Bartlett Arboretum by purchasing 15 acres of land on the edge of a town called Belle Plain, about 20 miles south of Wichita. The property had good soil, and it also had a little creek. One of Bartlett's initial moves was to dam up the creek and create a lake for waterfowl. In the flat expanse of Kansas, Bartlett was tree-obsessed. He planted them everywhere, lining walkways, drives, and riverbanks. Bartlett was also civic-minded. He added a baseball diamond complete with a grandstand to the Arboretum, and he added a running track and a place for trap shooting as well. After Walter died, the park was managed by his son, Glenn, who was a landscape architect. Glenn had studied the gardens at Versailles, and he noted that they were transformed out of sand dunes and marshes. Back home, the Bartlett Arboretum had similar challenges. Glenn married Margaret Myers. She was an artist, a magazine fashion designer, a floral designer, a garden club organizer, and an instructor. Combining their fantastic skill sets, Glenn and Margaret turned the Arboretum into something quite beautiful. Together, they incorporated tree specimens from all over the world. Using dredged dirt from the lake, they created islands. At one point, the Bartlett Arboretum was the only arboretum between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. Known for its beautiful spring tradition called tulip time, the arboretum featured a tulip bed with over 40,000 bulbs. In 1997, the Arboretum was sold to Robin Macy. Macy was one of the founding members of the Dixie Chicks, and she's the current steward of the Bartlett Arboretum. Naturally, she incorporated music into the Arb. The Facebook group for the Arboretum recently shared a register page from April 7th, 1929, and across the top of the register, Bartlett had quoted Wordsworth. He wrote, He is the happiest who has the power to gather wisdom from a flower. The folks who tend the flowers and trees at the Bartlett Arboretum make people happy all year long. In Unearthed Words, here are some poems about the winter's cold. As I read this, it's two degrees in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. This first one's from Richard Wilbur, the American poet, from his poem called 
orchard trees in January. The birds are gone. The ground is white. The winds are wild. They chill and bite. The ground is thick with slush and sleet. And I barely feel my feet. It's not the case, though some might wish it so, who from a window watch the blizzard blow white riot through their branches vague and stark that they keep snug beneath their pelted bark. They take affliction in until it gels to crystal ice between their frozen cells. And here's a poem from the New Zealand poet and writer Catherine Mansfield. It's called Winter Song. Snow and sleet and sleet and snow. Will the winter never go? What do beggar children do with no fire to cuddle to? Perhaps with nowhere warm to go. Snow and sleet and sleet and snow. Hail and ice and ice and hail. Water frozen in the pail. See the robins, brown and red. They are waiting to be fed. Poor deers battling in the gale. Hail and ice and ice and hail. Here's a line from the English poet, playwright, and actor, William Shakespeare. Blow, blow, thou winter wind. Thou art not so unkind as man's ingratitude. And here's a line from Edward Thomas, the British poet, essayist, and novelist from The Manor Farm. The winter's cheek flushed as if he had drained spring, summer, and autumn at a draught. And finally, here's a poem from Helen Bailey Davis. She was a Baltimore poet, and she won the Maryland Federation of Women's Clubs Poet Laureate Award. She wrote this poem in 1929 and sold it to the Christian Science Monitor, where it took off in newspapers around the country. It's called Jack Frost. Someone painted pictures on my window pane last night. Willow trees with trailing boughs and flowers frosty white and lovely crystal butterflies. But when the morning sun touched them with its golden beams, they vanished one by one. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Weird Plants by Chris Thoroughgood. Chris is a botanist at the Oxford Botanic Garden. And the cover of Chris's book is captivating. It shows a very weird plant. It almost looks like a claw. And in its grasp is the title of the book, Weird Plants. In this book published by Q Gardens, Chris shares all of the weird and wacky plants that he's encountered during his travels. There are orchids that look like a female insect, and there are giant pitcher plants, as well as other carnivorous plants that take down all kinds of prey. One thing's for certain, the weirdness factor of all of these plants has helped them survive for centuries. Gardeners will get a kick out of the seven categories that Chris uses to organize these strange specimens. He organized them into vampires, killers, fraudsters, jailers, accomplices, survivors, and hitchhikers. 
Chris's writing is complemented by his incredibly detailed oil paintings and his fascinating range of botanical expertise. As someone who works with student gardeners regularly, I appreciate botanists who are able to make plants interesting, taking topics and subjects that may otherwise prove boring and instead making them utterly captivating. Chris is that kind of garden communicator. In addition to weird plants, Chris is the author of The Field Guide to the Wildflowers of the Western Mediterranean. You can get a used copy of Weird Plants by Chris Thorogood and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $9. And here's today's great gift for gardeners. It's by Good Directions, one of my favorite companies for quality products, and it's their heart-shaped fly-through bird feeder, and it's got a beautiful copper finish. Good Directions calls this the heart fly-through bird feeder, and it combines simplicity with elegance. It's got a beautiful heart shape, and it's the perfect addition to any garden setting. It's easy to hang, it's easy to love, and because it's also see-through, it's easy to know when you need to fill it. When it's full, it can hold a generous four and a half pounds of seed. In particular, I love this piece for Valentine's Day or for a special birthday. If you know someone who loves to watch the birds from their house or deck, this will make a nice addition to any bird feeder or birdhouse collection. And this gift will always remind them how much they are loved with the heart design. This quality bird feeder will become an heirloom in your family and you can get the Good Directions Heart Fly-Through Bird Feeder with the copper finish and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for $68.64. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the birthday of the nurseryman known as Mr. Poinsettia, Paul Ecke Sr., who was born in Magdeburg, Germany, on this day in 1895. Paul and his family immigrated to the United States in 1906. When Paul took over his father's nursery business, located on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood in the early 1920s, the poinsettia, or Euphorbia pulcherima, was a fragile outdoor wild plant. Paul fell in love with the poinsettia, and he immediately felt that the plant was a perfect fit for the holiday season because the bloom time occurred naturally over the holidays. By 1924, Paul was forced out of Hollywood by the movie business, and he brought his family and the nursery to San Diego County. He and his wife, Magdalena, had four children, and they purchased 40 acres of land in Encinitas. It was here that Paul would turn his passion for poinsettias into a powerhouse. At one point, his nursery controlled 90% of the poinsettia market in the United States. At first, Paul raised poinsettias in the fields on the ranch. Each spring, the plants were harvested and then loaded onto two railroad cars and sent to greenhouse growers all along the East Coast. When Paul wasn't growing poinsettias, he was talking poinsettias. He started calling it the Christmas flower, and he was endlessly marketing poinsettias and praising their attributes as a harbinger of Christmas. Initially, Paul worked to decrease the growing time of the poinsettia by getting the time to bloom down from 18 months to 8 months. 
Paul made it possible for the poinsettia to be grown indoors. After figuring out how to propagate the plant through cuttings indoors, Paul was soon able to ship poinsettias around the world by plane. Paul's son, Paul Jr., took over the business in the 1960s, and he cleverly sent poinsettias to TV shows. When the holiday programs aired, there were the poinsettias on the set in their glory, decorating the stages of all the major programs. When Paul Jr. learned that women's magazines did their photo shoots for the holidays over the summer, he began growing a poinsettia crop that peaked in July. Magazines like Women's Day and Sunset were thrilled to feature the poinsettia in their Christmas magazines alongside Christmas trees and mistletoe. This venture into women's magazines is regarded as the Ecke family's biggest marketing success, and it made the poinsettia synonymous with Christmas. And gardeners will be fascinated to learn that the Ecke family was able to distinguish themselves as a superior grower of poinsettias by using a secret technique to keep their plants compact and hardy. Their solution was simple. They grafted two varieties of poinsettias together, causing every seedling to branch and become bushy. Competitor poinsettias were leggy and prone to falling open, but not so with the Ecchi poinsettia. By the 1990s, the Ecchi growing secret was out of the bag and competitors began grafting poinsettias together in order to compete. Finally, one of Paul's poinsettia pet peeves is the commonly held belief that poinsettias are poisonous. Sometimes that fear would prevent a pet owner or a young mother from buying the plant. Paul Ecke recognized the threat posed by this false belief, and he fought to reveal the truth one interview at a time. It turns out that a 50-pound child would have to eat roughly 500 poinsettia leaves before they would even begin to have a stomach ache. Furthermore, the plant is not dangerous to pets. To prove this point, Paul would regularly eat poinsettia leaves on camera during interviews over the holiday season. When the Ecchi Nursery sold in 2012, it still controlled over half the poinsettia market worldwide. During the holiday season, roughly 75 million poinsettia plants are sold, most to women over the age of 40. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org, and be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.